Welcome to the Trending Tokens podcast with Jake Bale and Jeff Pulver. Jake is a marketing consultant for T0 and consults in the security token space. Jeff is an internet pioneer known for his work in VOIP, has invested in more than 400 blockchain startups, and shares his knowledge through a program called the Pulver Edge. Today, we discuss the need for education in the security token space, the early ecosystem seen by issuers, and new digital security models based on cash flow, an option on an opportunity, or general customer experience rather than equity. All opinions on trending tokens are the opinions of Jake, Jeff, and the guests. Nothing should be taken as legal or trading advice. The content of this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. You know, there's there's a couple things coming up that are interesting. Um, the overstock dividend, obviously, the OSTKO dividend coming up on September 23rd. Um, well, it's, good that, it's good they announced that there is a date to it. And I, I think that it's a good um, a test run to see how things scale. And, and to some extent, it's actually pretty okay that, you know, we learn from these things. You know, it's, I, I just, you know, I went back to the last podcast and I just never thought I'd ever say Patrick Byrne, Overstock, Spy Who Loved Me in the same sentence. I, I just, and yeah. I'm saying that past me and I'm thinking about the future. And I think what we need to get past is besides mechanics, because, you know, we could pick on people, but the reality is that operations is operations. And I've worked in Wall Street and, you know, things happen. And then you get a process down and it just works and it occurs. The one thing that I have not seen yet, and I am scouting all the time, looking for people who want to take the plunge, are deals, entrepreneurs, dr driven by entrepreneurs who want to take advantage of uh, digital securities because it's their future. And, and that's what I think we need to be doing is finding uh, ways to educate entrepreneurs who are doing fundraising, that there are ways to um, benefit from the future of finance. And that rather than just raising startup capital from friends, friends and family, uh, yes, there are people who are doing crowdfunding, but a lot of friends I know who start high tech companies, it's because a VC gave them $3 million. And, and this whole idea about digital securities is either in a gray area or an area they don't want to touch. But the reality is this is the future. And, and if we can put together and groom a bunch of future entrepreneurs to think about how they could leverage the future for themselves today, all of a sudden um, gray turns to sunny and, and we're going to have a lot of sunshine in front of us in terms of how the future of finance evolves quicker or slower. And, you know, I'm making the big assumption that all broker dealers, not just to pick on one or two, but all broker dealers will, will have a re-education. They'll understand how these things will work in the future and that there will be um, exchanges all over the world that want to trade these um, digital securities. And what we need is a market, a, a market driven by great uh, opportunities to invest, a market driven by great companies to invest in. And, and I think that, you know, we're still right now at the stage where it's still the ecosystem of the issuers and the, and the ecosystem of the system operators. And, you know, I, I can draw a very, very, very strong parallel to something I lived through uh, through the 90s, which is the evolution of voice over IP. Now, a lot of people say, What's, what does voice over IP and digital securities have, have in common? Like, like what's, why are you even mentioning that? Well, let me tell you, I'm very fortunate to have been at the edge of the creation of the whole industry. And I, and I had the courage to host the first successful trade show for that industry. And the first uh, few months, the first few years I ran the event, most of the exhibitors that I had were companies who were selling chips, four chips, people writing, creating software, uh, people who were doing system integration. The, the, there were no big phone companies coming in because they were not ready to purchase yet. But guess what? The systems integrators needed the software companies. The software companies ultimately needed the chip vendors. The chip vendors ultimately would then need to create an end-to-end -end product offering. And finally, the telcos, when they showed up, had a product they can test and deploy. And a lot of you know pushback I used to get on my trade show floors is that, gee, it's vendors talking to vendors. Well, guess what? That's how an industry grows. That's how an industry is born. It's not like we're announcing the evolutions in front of us come and brace. It took three to five years for voice over IP to take off, to hit mainstream, for it to actually be something where the telcos took really strong um, awareness of. And these days, you have consumers around the world are using voice over IP every day and don't know about it because it's just part of their life. They take it for granted. And if you think about where we're at right now with the issuance of dividends, the issuance of tokens, 
and having to worry about security token protocols and having to worry about uh, what, who's issuing what and how, where and when, we're so early. And, and that what we need to be doing is bringing everybody together to talk business because no one company yet will be strong enough to monopolize the whole ecosystem. But what we want to see is the ecosystem talking and engaging and growing. And, and then things will flourish. And, you know, in the case of um, the industry I was very much behind, it helped to get telcos to be early trial users. The Telecom New Zealand was a very was one of the first companies to try things out back in 96. There was a there's stuff happening in Telenor in Norway. There's stuff happening in Sweden. There, there are some tests happening behind big closed doors of the big telcos in the U.S., but nobody was talking about it. But a lot of R&D was going on. Trust me, the banks today all know how to spell blockchain. The banks today all understand op back office operations. Some of the broker dealers, they also understand blockchain. They understand that, that you know how we deal with transactions, how we're going to deal with the new back office. They're preparing for it. It's just it's slow on the uptake, but it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, yeah, about the overstock dividend, um, I saw IG.com is the first one to have done this. They sent out an email saying that they would not support it, which shouldn't make a difference for the people who hold it, I don't think. As far as I understand, that if, if the broker doesn't support it, it ends up at computer share and then can be claimed into a dyno account. But it's interesting to see them proactively have sent an email to the overstock holders telling them. So they're aware of what's going on. Well, I'll just say that there's a lot of education that has to happen. That one of the key things here is, is education for shareholders. There's education for broker dealers. There's education for people who are considering the, the issuance of this. And, and what type of, you know, um, dark holes are we jumping into? It's sort of like uh, Alice in Wonderland and we're on the other side of the looking glass. And what are we looking up into? And, and, and how did we get here? And, and oh my God, you know, now it's a rabbit. Now it's a Mad Hatter. Like, what are we going to do? And, and the thing is, it's all good. It, it's just, there are people who are concerned about reality because they just assume because the digital securities, uh, div, digital dividends announced, they can touch it. I think it's a wonderful way in theory to drive end user adoption to a platform. Because the thing is, if you and I were car manufacturers, you know, maybe we would know who our customers are because people want to sign up for the warranties and people want to come in and they, they want to get up, updates when we have updates. But if we're manufacturers of widgets and we sell millions of widgets every year, there's a very good chance that maybe 1%, 1%, 2% of our customers register with us for the warranty and we don't know who anyone else is. Having the ability for a company to issue a digital dividend is pure genius because it enables uh, companies, uh, in this case, Overstock, to have direct contact, if you will, with the people who will hold on to their, um, uh, you know, who will hold on to their shares. Now, some people may want to trade anonymously and autonomously. There are some people who don't want to have to disclose who they bank with. Some people don't want to have to disclose a lot of privacy information. But, you know, there's a give and a take here. And, you know, if you are on one side of the one side of the equation and you would like to have better communications with your with the people who are investing with you. This is a great thing. Um, it, it may not go smoothly, but it will go. And, and people will try. They'll be critical because they want to be, because they're thinking very short-term tactical, but it's a great strategic decision. But again, outside of overstock, outside of a few real estate deals, which we can question what the real benefit truly is, um, when will the big top tech companies go this way. You know, what if WeWork wasn't going to do IP an IPO, but they actually did a security token offering? You there's know, an interesting thing being um, considered by, there's a crowdfunding company in the UK, and I think Smartland is the name of the company. They're talking about potentially tokenizing shares, pre-IPO shares in unicorn companies. So, that, that it, so, so it's not even up to the company if they're going to be doing it. It's just these guys are going to make a fund and the fund is going to represent you know, $50 million of stock in this company or something like that. Uh, the, the thing to watch out for, and this happened to me when I was a holder of Twitter, is that the board of directors can actually have a say whether or not they can be sold prior to the IPO or what the lockup is. So there's a lot of gotchas in the, in the small, small print and some of the offerings, but sure, and share posts and other places which provide secondary markets for pre-IPO companies. Uh, it'd be wonderful if they offered digital access, you know, digital assets, if you will, or shares to invest in. I believe that will happen. 
Um, but again, it's one thing for uh, the, the one percenters of the company to sell off a little bit of their interest. I'm talking about you and I being the next big thing. And we're saying to the world, you know what? We're going digital because we understand this is the future and we're going direct. And we're going to have direct communication with our customers. And, and we're going to enable everything we possibly can to be on the edge of innovation, the edge of the vision, and, and, and truly align our, our investors, perhaps with our customer base, perhaps with our supply chain, and see what happens. You know, it was a very big move the day that Howard Stern announced he was going off of broadcast radio and onto satellite radio. But it put Cirrus Radio on the map because we grew up, I grew up in a generation where radio was free. Like, why in the world would I pay any money for, for, for a satellite uh, you know, radio uh, subscription? Because I get Howard Stern locally on my, on my radio station for free. But, but getting Howard Stern on put Cirrus Radio on the map. And I, about 10 years ago, I was, you know, to friends who would listen to me, I was saying, you know what Fox really needs to do? They got to get put American Idol, take it off of Fox and put it only on the internet. Let's do, let's broadcast only on the internet, have that big moment where we're broadcasting live and provide back channel communication to the judges from the fans to the people. And let's do that because that would then skyrocket us. Uh, at the time I was very big into streaming media that would skyrocket the usage of these technologies would be a proof point where we could just do it and this is the future. And I was, uh, I've inv I invested a lot in a whole bunch of internet TV startups, including my own. And I thought it was inevitable it was gonna happen. Well, it's inevitable, but it doesn't happen overnight. But here I'm thinking of something similar. It's one thing to ride in the coattails and ride in the long tail of, of how these technologies can be used. But if we could find a handful of entrepreneurs from around the world who can use these platforms in a way that's strategic to their future growth, that would be super, super cool. Um, but for now, it's hypothetical. But if you want to know when will this market become real, uh, in my opinion, it's when we get the, uh, the attention of Silicon Valley and we're somehow disrupting Silicon Valley just a little bit. Uh, when, because when, we're now living in this era, like 20 years ago when I was talking about the future of the internet, in theory, if you were connected to the internet, it did not matter where in the world you were living, you could do quite well off of the internet economy. Well, 20 years ago, we didn't have, you know, broadband the way we have it today globally. We didn't have 3 billion plus people connected to this communication network. We do now. And more and more, we're seeing people who are nomadic setting up shop anywhere in the world that has internet access and they're thriving and they're contributing to the internet economy. I do believe that small companies, medium companies and large companies, if they understood and under properly understood what digital finance could offer to them and they were so inspired, we could, be, we could be, literally be funding the next economy, the economy of the unbanked, the economy of the future generation of what things evolve to and not be limited just to one part of the financial, the fintech ecosystem that we know. I mean, on one hand, my understanding is retail crypto is about 80% in the Chinese market. So being in the West, we don't see a lot of what truly happens. That said, my thinking is mostly in the West in terms of, you know, big IPOs and deals that we're seeing. Yes, things uh, do amazing out of Asia too. But, you know, Silicon Valley is much closer to me than, um, you know, than, than the Far East. And so I'm thinking domestically, how do we make this exciting for the average tech startup to, to, to dream, dream big and empower it? Because that's what we need to jumpstart our market. Uh, friends of mine are hosting a summit with the, government, with the support of the government of Bermuda in mid-October. I was invited to speak and I suggested a session called jumpstarting the, uh, the uh, I think, securities, the securities token marketplace. And I, I just looked at the agenda and it was sort of like uh, the big elephant in the room is no one's talking about this. And, and we all believe in it, but we, we need to address it. I, I think a lot of time is spent, needs to be spent on education. Um, and it's take away the hype, take away all the other stuff. Uh, I think it's market education is key, particularly to broker dealers who plan on being in business for the next 10 years. You know, the, the, this part of this market reminds me so much of when I was working on Wall Street and there were comms IT managers who were used to using old systems, all analog, and when we were switching over to digital, they didn't care because they were retiring in three years and they're getting out of there and they'll let the next generation pick this up. You know, depending upon the mindset of who, who your broker dealers are, 
Some people may be passing the baton to the next generation and will not embrace this. And we have to hopefully find ways to clearly delineate education, knowledge transfer, and get the ecosystems to care enough so that they embrace this. Otherwise, you know, what, was, what did not happen in 2019 may not happen in 2020 and may not happen until 2022. Yes, I believe this all does happen, but not at the pace that I was seeing in the projections. Is this a four quadrillion dollar marketplace in our lifetime? Maybe. I don't know. There's big numbers. You know, can we digitize everything? Sure. Maybe it's, you know, uh, I don't know what, what happens after quadrillion, but it's, it could be a really, really big number. But we need to first get off the hype horse and focus on the practical realities of getting our back office systems working, communicating exactly what the purpose and intention is behind it, and finding the companies who will shine and help the industry shine of course, they decided to take a chance and go this route. And, and I do think that we need tech scouts, if you will, some people who, who will be re reining in the next big things into the marketplace to give us a try. Because theoretically, this may sound like great news to companies. And maybe there are things that are broken that we don't even see yet. And I would like to go through the motions and actually take some case studies through the process. And let's see where this works see where we need regulatory clarity because we maybe everything is covered maybe it's not but until these high profile ipos go a digital route or even supplement an ipo with a digital offering which we can do oh they can do we i'm just sitting here um you know i, I think there's a lot of potential and I the one issue with uh, low liquidity in the digital markets is that if the company is issuing an equity token they could end up hurting their valuation if they don't have the right trading volume, the right price, and then they, you know, could prevent themselves from being able to raise in the future or yeah. just, yeah. Look, you know, look really bad. And so I think that's one of the big, big risks. But someone like WeWork who came out and they just knocked $20 billion off of their, um, you know, initial public, public offering price, maybe they could consider doing, you know, a different route. Uh, WeWork might need to drop off a few more billion. You know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't provide any investment advice, but just from a practical reality of things, there are balloons and then there are pops and somewhere in between we work. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, some people have an overinflated sense of self. It, it happens all the way down. And don't forget, in the food chains of the dot-coms, uh, at least for the first 20-plus deals that were offered in the 90s that were in the dot-com era, everybody is, who was part of that food chain made money. And there was a lot, enough upside for everybody to have this really frothy ecosystem that just worked. In security token land, we needed the same thing. We need to leave money on the table so the next person up the food chain and down the food chain can make money. Otherwise, if people get too greedy too early, this will not thrive. The, the oxygen will be taken out of the room and we just be filled with carbon monoxide and it will kill people and it will kill deals. And so um, perhaps we should be thinking about hybrids Maybe this, should be, maybe this should be regulated as security tokens, but no proper equity issued. Maybe we're talking about rights. Maybe we're talking about land rights, air rights. Maybe we're talking about the right to get a priority when a new product is available. I mean, I happen to be geeky when it comes to uh, astrophotography. And I, I believe that the five-year-old uh, Sony a7S II is still the best camera in the world to take uh, night photos. Uh, Sony has gone as forth to say that they are coming out with a, uh, the next version uh, the A7, the uh, A7S III. Now, if I had some Sony tokens and I had a, that gave me a priority to purchase the to purchase that camera, I might be in the market for that. And I, you know, so so companies, consumer brands, could think about having tokens to show customer appreciation, but something else it gives me a little discount, maybe if I'm a holder of their tokens, plus a priority for for when the when the cameras become available for people who are really into Tesla who can't get hold of a car because there's a one year delay on some models gives people that, you know, for people who want to be uh, rocketed into space and they're waiting 10 years to go on these rockets to go up into the upper atmosphere and, you know, one day be a guest on the space station. Um, there are lots of places and reasons why tokens can matter. Uh, some for your pure fun, sometimes for pure pleasure, and sometimes it's just really good business of being there to satisfy the needs to your customers. And you can have me engaged in ways that don't necessarily represent traditional equity so that I am buying something that I hope will increase in value because maybe it costs a dollar today. If, if I'm going to fly to the space station in 10 years, maybe I pay a dollar today and tomorrow it's $2 and a year from now it's $10. 
So I think that my pass and my opportunity to ride on, on that on that flight will go up in value as we get closer to launch. So yes, I'm buying something that I think will appreciate in value. So therefore, maybe it is a security. So I'm not saying that we don't apply security regulations to this, but maybe we're not talking about equity. Maybe we need to be talking about cash flow. Maybe we're talking about an option on an option or an opportunity. And of course, if you get into the entertainment space, maybe we're talking about your know, custom user experiences for once in a lifetime things that we that you could benefit from because you are a token holder. There was an interesting update. One of the start engine companies uh, paid a cash dividend, which I think was the first one in equity crowdfunding to have done that. Cash, um, what a kind yeah. of cash, wow. <laughs> a cash dividend, I know. <laughs> Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, as, as people start seeing, and, and I don't know exactly what the company was doing, some kind of recycling or battery, green technology, something. Um, but they were, you know, they're already making enough money that they can pay a dividend and they're still in the crowdfunding stage. They might have been like an a, a plus, but it's interesting to see companies start to use their capital for something other than trying to sell the company. I like that. That's, that, that's a positive. You know, on trending tokens, you know, we're looking at all sorts of tokens. And, um, you know, I am interested in deals that are um, hybrids. I'm looking at things which are outside the box, what people learned when they were going to school, when people were sitting for their exams, there are certain black and white examples of what things could be. And the, the nice thing about Finance 3.0 is we're unbounded in terms of what we can do, that we understand there are rules, we understand the regulations, and we have creativity. And, and how do we comply to the law and how do we sell deals um, or how can customers benefit from this? Good, you know, I'm always interested in, in, in how people are thinking outside the box. And I, I really would like to believe that we will see more outrageous, outrageously wonderful thinkers and doers. And, and maybe the big deals don't come out of the States. Maybe they come out of Europe. Maybe they come out of South America. Maybe they're coming out from Asia. I don't know. But they, sh they can come here and we can participate. It's just, it's just, you know, because I look at the headline news inside of the security token world and, you know, it's nice to know that a certain platform's supporting another protocol. It's nice to know that uh, we're seeing, yeah, a few more real estate deals. But but with the volume, like, you know, have you, did you see the trading volume on, on the T0 um, security token? It's not going through the roof. It's still pretty darn thin. And, and despite the news and announcements, and I read the press releases, we're still seeing thin trading, not, not like a lot of trading, not big spreads. Um, and so why is that? M maybe because I think people don't understand what they're buying and selling. That, you yeah, know, that's a, big, a huge part of it. A huge part of it is understanding what they're buying and selling. You know, it's like caveat on tour or whatever, but it's, it's, we don't know. I'm not saying people are doing bad things. It's just a lack of understanding, a lack of a, of a main street investor. You know, we waited for a year for non-accredited investors to be able to come in and buy these things. And we, and there was a, I don't know, perhaps falsely, but I thought also that there'd be huge market demand for these uh, types of instruments. And I think that the main street investor, it's, I mean, like WTF. I think a big part of it was that it was linked so closely to the price of Bitcoin and just blockchain technology in general. And then having yeah. our crypto winter going on has made people say, oh, maybe this isn't. But I, to you and me, I mean, I think security tokens are sort of totally outside of crypto. Like they're not, I don't consider them. I, 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 you know, I, I consider crypto a bad word in many, in many instances. You know, it, it is, I, I think security tokens represents a, a straight line path to the future of how finance can be and how we'll evolve. Crypto is a nice distraction. But if we're looking at how things can be done in, in, in the 21st century, 22nd century, the, the advent of the, of the concept of smart contracts, the ability to have immutable trust within our operating systems and within our ability to do business, it represents something we never had before, something we thought we had before, but trust is trust and love is love and, and somewhere in between is where we're at. And so you know, I, I do think that um, if people think that security tokens are crypto outside of the regulation space, which we won't reference, um, that's a mistake. And um, I, I really, you know, there is a crypto winter, but, you know, that depends upon whose season you're in. You know, sometimes you could be in your own personal summer and you're sitting next to somebody who's still living in the winter time or living in the autumn. And, and it's because, you know, they, they chose unwisely. You know, they invested wherever they went to and now their head is so stuck 
in this, in one mindset, they're not seeing something else. They're blinded by either greed or by missed opportunities. And they're not able to ground themselves to see what's in front of them. And I, I do think that um, you know, with a T zero, the timing could have been worse between, uh, let's face it, the, the reality of the retail investor be able to come in and to buy things, uh, the lack of really understanding what it was perhaps, and then the sudden departures. I mean, it was all sort of glummed together in the same month, so. Yeah, the offering was announced, um, I think it was within a couple of days of Bitcoin's all time high. So right. it was just. So, and the thing is, you know, the, on one hand, we have the, 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 the combination in people's minds between blockchain, Bitcoin, and this. And then the reality is that, you know, I'm not aware of any technology platform in the history of the internet and the history of tech that has benefited from, let's say, a trillion dollars worth of earned media. If you think about all the news stories, all the news articles written, created since 2017, and earned media means that nobody paid for these, these stories to be written. Earned media would look at how, what the reached audience is and how much of it. And so maybe a trillion is an understatement, but I don't know any industry in the world, really. I mean, you have robotics, you have smart cities, you have you know, the whole self-driving cars, but really I think blockchain Bitcoin has been the biggest benefit, biggest, biggest uh, beneficiary of earned media. And so, um, you know, just because, you know, wherever you go in the world, there is awareness of blockchain and Bitcoin, doesn't mean that there's awareness at all of what a security token is. Certainly that doesn't mean there's any awareness about any of the things that we would find interesting is. And we've not, I've not seen much effort in trying to bridge the gap between what is and was and is not Bitcoin, what is and is not blockchain. And, you know, you sometimes you start a conversation with a would-be entrepreneur who's looking to raise money. And, you know, if you, if you want to truly explain Bitcoin blockchain to somebody, that's an hour. Um, you know, I, I've seen people explain it in five minutes by saying that, you know, here's a painting, it's here. If I give it to you, you have it. And we're able to assure the transfer of, of value where there's only one copy there. So it's not like you took a photograph and you and I have two copies. It means, no, you have this, I don't have it anymore. Um, but I've seen, I've sat in these meetings. And, and so a meeting that was very promising turned into an, uh, an introduction uh, to, to blockchain and Bitcoin. And I never could break out of what happened next and what the potential is and why this, may, why this type of offering could be good for your business because um, I'm just sitting there listening and, you know, typically I'm trying to tell a friend of mine that this might be an alternative, particularly people who heard of crowdfunding, but don't know about it. I'm, uh, I'm very bullish on, uh, being able to go to your communities and get network effects to help build your business. You ne never before, I mean, we had it maybe as civilizations were evolving, there was some concept of people getting together to help each other out. But now, you know, if you're a brand and you could somehow communicate with the masses and go online and raise a half a million dollars from a community, it's pretty empowering. And, and that's a big, big change in that, you know, just because um, you have this great idea and don't have personal funds doesn't mean you can't get funded. And, and a lot of dreams are being funded these days. And, I, and I'm really bullish about that. And I think that, you know, what, what could be a half a million dollar dream to, to a million dollar dream can now be a $50 million dollar if you go away reggae at reggae plus. And, and all of a sudden, this is large amounts of money given to people who can just dream and articulate and share their story. And how are these dreams traded? Well, eventually they're traded on digital exchanges, perhaps. Um, and this is mind blowing to so many people who think that if they want to get their company funded, they have to get people to write checks. And, 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 and so I'm trying to help people extend their dreams that even if people said no to them because they're not investing today, it doesn't mean they can't go to the crowdfunding platforms, put together a compelling story and find people who they don't know to invest in their dreams. I saw a very compelling story the other day um, from a CBD company, uh, one of the you know medical marijuana sort of space companies. But since it's CBD, it's not regulated like medical marijuana. And they're we would call that hemp, 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 and the hemp side. But the, so they have a they have a CBD extraction process that's a natural process that uses some kind of crazy I don't know uh, chemistry to separate the CBD, and they're. Uh, offering entitles people to different levels of wholesale discounts should they want to become a wholesaler in the product. Well, and the genius. product is such that, Pure genius. And yeah, and the product is such that once you've tried it, it's something that you can sort of, I mean, I'm not going to make any medical claims, but 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good product and it's, not, it's something for you know, anti-inflammatory type stuff or helping with sleep, not something to uh, be a drug. And I think that people that try this product that invest in the company will want to be at those different wholesale levels. And so the level you invest at is your permanent discount in the wholesale program moving forward. Look, it sounds like it might also turn into a mark, multi-level marketing um, schema. So be careful about MLMs. Uh, however, the idea put forthwith in what you're saying works in lots of different situations, not, in, not necessarily for multi-level marketing, but that whole idea of being able to plant a seed and give discounts based on how we see utilization, how we see pickup. This is all good stuff and yeah i mean even really, buying at the wholesale level could just be your own purchases to yourself you don't have to be a wholesaler you don't have to go around right. trying to with friends right and so we can extend that model you know into other industries and and what we see pioneering in uh the mer medical marijuana space or the hemp space you know there it's uh, you know it's it's funny to me in some ways that you know, a lot of people don't talk about pornography and i'm not suggesting that we should but the reality is it's the porn industry that uh, brought so many changes to how we work and live in consumer electronics because you know, we would, the, 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 the VCRs were basically funded by that industry. You know, video discs, the same thing. And so the, while people don't talk about porn, the reality is that that industry brought forth a lot of change that the everyday consumer benefited from because of the market acceptance. Yeah, even online company. credit card processing was a huge... That industry changed the way that. So, they, and by the way, same thing for value-added services by the telcos. So many of those uh, SEX lines um, were all driven by that, and that gave ideas for the astrology, uh, for the astrology hotline, and for this hotline. And so we've seen like one industry segment that was perhaps d considered dark by some people, or by many people, actually giving a lot of light to opportunities for innovation. Now you're seeing people and you have to almost excuse yourself that you're talking about medical marijuana, <laughs> that we're talking about cannabis, that we're talking about this. And maybe there's a darkness and a light associated with that, but it turns out that in the internet era, so if you think about it this way, that the, uh, the porn industry prior to the internet helped bring forth huge changes to consumer electronics. Post internet era, which would say it's like post 95, it also has driven a lot of change. Of course, that industry has actually been disrupted by its own success because of the freely available access to content. So that, that, that whole thing, but you've seen that. And I believe now that we're in this, you know, new type of uh, financial boom market with, uh, with the cannabis and, and, and the deregulation, if you will, of certain things that have been regulated for many, many years, that's going to have a lot of offspring too. And you'll see that people who have been adopting ways to leverage and invest in hemp and invest in CBD and, and invest in all sorts of technology, uh, those types of technologies will actually give light to a whole other industry sector. So yes, perhaps here on trending tokens, we're not talking about porn. We may or may not be talking about cannabis, but the reality is, is that our friends who may be listening, they'll be the beneficiaries of the work being done and pioneered by those companies. And that's the truth. Yeah, I, the, the, there's another one that I saw. Um, th I don't know if they're going to do uh, equity crowdfunding, but they were at a conference that I was at that they sell a bicycle that also has a motor. So it's sort of like a moped. Um, and they had, I think that they had like six or 7,000 customers and around $2 million a year in revenue. And they were considering doing an equity crowdfunding. And I told them, this is for your company. You are the exact kind of company that should be doing this. Yeah. And you have people that buy these bikes. And then two years later, they buy another one of these bikes. So you have these, this repeat business, and I'm sure that all of them have enough money that they would want to also invest in the company. And uh, there was that exercise bike company, I can't remember what the name of it is, but they're in the process of doing an IPO. And yeah, I think that it's right alongside of that sort of like- if you Yeah, I, I was envisioning that, 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 that to be named exercise bike company when you were speaking, uh, Pentalon or whatever it's called. And it's, but it's, I've seen there are too many other advertisements, but clearly their name didn't uh, get driven into my mind. But the idea of having a shared user experience with one instructor, with us all over the world, watching and working out and panting, and 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 getting and you know getting into shape and exp and experiencing those moments, um, uh, you know, it's it's all great stuff. It's just I, I think that we have the cart before the horse, and sometimes the horse before the cart. And if we could find the opportunities for them to to get together, uh, there will be trending digital securities. We we will see a marketplace where there's frothy market volumes. It's you know, for me, uh, we need to see an uptick in, 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 in uh, just in trading volume, something. There, there's, we need to see some way to provide some comfort 
that we're on the right path to those people who are naysayers. Because uh, right now, there's probably some naysayers who are saying, you know, I told you, yeah, it's the future, but why worry about it today? Now, I lived through the same type of people during the evolution of voice over IP. You know, I was there when things were super hypey and then not so hypey. Very hypey, not so hypey. When things are not so hypey and you're still doing this day to day because this is your living, uh, it's sometimes hard to get the attention of the people you want to get to. In the end, we changed the world. In the end, uh, digital securities will change the world of finance. It's inevitable. The time frame may shift a little bit, um, but it's happening. And, and so I am... Yeah, I, I encourage people to explore what's possible in crowdfunding, particularly if you're an entrepreneur and listening, which would be amazing. I, I encourage large companies who are thinking of going public to consider having at least a class of something. We'll call it equity, although it may not be equity, but we don't, it won't be debt. So a class of something, which is digital. Maybe it's not your entire offering. Maybe it's just a piece of it. And that layer gives you special access rights, special benefits, special this, special that. You know, hasn't happened yet. Doesn't mean it won't happen. And I, yeah, and, and I, I think that I think Overstock is doing um, with the OSTKO dividend. They have a pretty um, extensive t amount of time between the September twenty third dividend date and the date that the dividends will be issued on November fifteenth. So they're planning on a lot of onboarding, and you know, if all these people, forty thousand shareholders, or the number of shareholders that they're expecting. Um, will be claiming OSTKO dividends. And if we put 40,000 people on the platform, I don't know how many are on it now, but it's not 40,000. I, I would, for whatever reason, I, I'm highly doubtful that all 40,000 would possibly understand the process they have to go through to get it. Um, that said, it'd be nice to see some percentage. It, it, it'd be nice if Overstock disclosed what percentage of their shareholders are right now do they know about. And, and publish, basically publish a sort of a chart that, that lets us track the progress. Are we at 1% or are we at 10%? Are we at 79%? We don't know it. You know, there's some information that would be helpful for the industry to understand. Oh, it's a and case also, study for everybody. I mean, Tesla, any of these companies that are having issues with short sellers or, or are thinking about going digital, you know, this, this is going to be the case study. So I think eventually that information should be out. Right, but we, we'll, what will we know in November? Not so much. And so it, it'd be kind of nice, you know, hypothetically to, um, to just see where we're at. It's because if, if, if there's a company, if there's a board member, you know, of a, of a publicly traded or soon to be publicly traded company, you know, listening to somebody talking about security tokens, I would like to have them ha believe that there's a positive outcome that could happen. That it, it's one thing to go down that route of we, we went – we were, we're the brand new, you know, uh, gold rush. We're now, we're going with the digital securities. Great. Um, how do we implement it? You know, we need to, to go through the growing pains of seeing uh, ar around the United States, around the world, end-to-end -end solutions that have been deployed where everybody who understands how to use a Bloomberg terminal understands how to transfer value um, through uh, dividends issued through these platforms. We, we need to make it seamless. And an interesting on. timeline for this, <clears throat> in equity crowdfunding, I think the JOBS Act was 2008, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so, and, 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 so, and, and, and they're, they're still educating companies well. to this day, letting them know right. how you can raise money with equity crowdfunding. Point, right, and now we're in 20, so that was, it was 20, 2008 modified at 2012. There's all these modifications. So now we're going to 2020, that's 12 years. So what we're really talking about is by 20, uh, 2030, 20, you know, I, I, I wonder what will happen. You know, perhaps there'll be another way of doing this that, that transforms the world. It took forever for Fix, by the way, to, uh, to change things, to at least understand settlement. I mean, it took a lot of these things that took place in the 80s and 90s, you take for granted today, but change sometimes takes a long, long time and there's a long tail on that. Uh, the direct tokenization of the pre-IPO stock, I think, might be one of those things that would bring a lot of new user adoption from retail investors, because currently the pre-IPO stuff is only available to accredited investors. So if there's a way right. to tokenize some of that pre-IPO stock, get people involved that way, I think that's a little bit more enticing than sort of this company's got a 10-year trajectory and, you know, maybe it'll be worth something in 10 years. I consider that the rethink of wit capital because in the height of the dot-com boom, 
uh, companies like Wood Capital came to the marketplace and offered the everyday, res um, if you will, the non-accredited investor, the retail investor, the chance that take get 50 shares, 100 shares of the big hot um, IPO that's coming out. And I, and I think that what you're really talking about is, a, is, is that opportunity in a digital form. Yes, it's not exactly the same thing, but it provides a reason for people to get off there, to get up and take action. And rather than be on the by, by, be bystanders to be, become participants, because uh, we need action, we need volume, we need people who are going to play. It's it's uh, you know if if no one's showing up, what's really going on? And and so you know we can get really caught up in the regulation, we can get really caught up in the technology, but at the end of the day, if there are people who are not using these platforms and there's illiteracy out there, uh, we need some people to go out there and preach and to teach. We need to make sure that while they're preaching and teaching that on the back end, everything's working end to end. And we need somebody to do the biz dev for the industry to bring those really hot companies into the space. I do think pre-IPO stocks issued um, somehow being made available to unaccredited investors legally properly is a great offer uh, in theory, certainly if it's a basket of them, but you know, everyone has to make their own investment decisions. I'm just being a fan person here, just, uh, hoping for positivity and uh you know I, uh, I i've seen back office systems break down and i've seen back office systems work uh unemployment friday on wall street when i was there was a big day it was when if you're in systems you hope you didn't get fired when everything crashed because when, when we went through the transition of analog systems to digital systems yep there are those few moments those few trades we couldn't do and it cost the company probably millions of dollars every time but we eventually got through it and we are now living in this digital age on wall street and so there will be growing pains it doesn't mean that the, the it doesn't mean the theories aren't good it just means that we need to give ourselves time and that you know we, someone has to be out there helping to educate uh and teach and uh go beyond their own borders and, and help inspire competition inspire innovators to drive things and think through the impact of what we are and we're not doing and what we could do so I, I am bullish in the market segment. Um, I try to live outside the hype of, of what people are pushing today. But I would like to see companies who can execute. I would like to think that we can all be working together in sharing the message and growing the industry. I would agree. And I think that's a good place to uh, leave everyone off today. And um, we can revisit this, I guess, maybe next week. Jump sure. on we, we could do that and, and they could of course tweet you and I if they like to and uh yeah if anyone's got topics that they want to hear about uh Jeff and I are always available we'll both reply to tweets we do and then also if you're uh, on LinkedIn you can follow Jeff send Jeff a request and you can follow Jeff's daily Jeff on LinkedIn well, almost almost daily Jeff. almost daily Jeff <laughs> oh man <laughs> sorry <laughs> Jeff's daily okay. Jeff is not it's not daily it's almost daily <laughs> that's the disclaimer yeah <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I tried doing it daily, and I realized, nah. LinkedIn has great engagement. I mean, from what I've seen in the groups that I'm in in LinkedIn, when someone posts a story, like it gets a lot more than what you see on Facebook. Uh, uh, my own personal experience is that uh, earlier today I went LinkedIn Live with an episode, and in a few hours I was at sixteen hundred views, and on Facebook I was less than a hundred. Yeah, and, and I think that's, and you probably have more friends on Facebook than you do on LinkedIn, with me, I guess, or maybe I, I, I have more real friends on Facebook. I have yeah. more contacts, uh, connections on LinkedIn, but people who actually I know, who I, whose names I recognize, higher on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, LinkedIn's very content poor right now, I'd say, especially when it comes to video. So that's a good, good spot to be at. Yes, I highly recommend those people who want to give something bleeding edge a try, go live on LinkedIn, it's fun. <laughs> 